Yeah. What, what were some of the strangest things you saw in prison? A guy was getting released the next day and he tried to escape. <laughs> How much were you making living on the streets, begging at the roads? If, if I tell you a figure, the people will all stop their work and start working on the streets. Five rounds into there and only one of them hit there. So you were like dodging the bullets? Basically like that. You're like the Matrix dude. <laughs> What's up everyone? My name is Josh and this is the Wide Awake Podcast. Are you ready? Today I have a very special guest. His name is Gary Let's go. and um, he is currently living on the streets. He lives on the streets in an area called Sea Point um, in, a, in a tented area and he's here to share his story. Mm. Yeah, I live on the streets. It's, it's, we officially have got accommodation. So it's, as far as officials are concerned, we have got a place to stay. We've got an address which is a step in the right direction. Um, I'm allowed to use the address for legal purposes, which is the first time I've been able to do that in five years, something like that. Because you're staying in a little settlement now. It's a settlement and it's, and it's, a, um, it's been declared uh, uh, we're allowed to stay there. They can't chase us away. The police aren't allowed to just come in there and do it like they want to do. They do try though. They try their best. Yesterday they were <laughs> in there again. But the people that are there... Give them the gaps because they're stupid. Mm. They stand and do drugs in the open. You don't do things like that. You self-respect is what. Respect yourself and the others you around respect, you. You can't respect anything until you respect yourself. And by standing, smoking drugs in public, you, you can't be, you can't expect somebody to respect you. So is, is that the people, the other people that are staying with you, they're doing yeah, that? Yeah, they, 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 they just do what they want to do and, Three o'clock in the morning, they'll have a, a running battle through the streets of Seapoint and over a cigarette lighter, over something pathetic. It's, it's, they're childish. It's, 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 they're going to get nowhere, but they think they are somebody. So I want to talk about your story, mm, right? Mm, mm. I mean, if, so you, how long have you been living on the streets for? I was a, like, like 13 years about 20, 10 years. Uh, plus, plus minus 10 years. I was, I was off the streets. I went clean off the drugs for just under a year. I was, that was 2017, 2018. But then straight away back. And when you go back, every time you go back, it's worse. It's heavier and it's heavier and it gets deeper and it gets deeper. And the old baggage comes with you and you get a lot more. And all your comfort zones that you had before, you think you can walk back into them, they're gone. Like everything else is gone. It's not easy. Yeah, and I think what you say is true. It gets worse every time. Every time. Where I don't know, obviously, about being homeless. Yeah. But when you talk about drug addiction, yes. something you faced as well, um, it is every time you get clean and then you relapse, it gets worse and worse. Often because you know that there's another you, way you, out. You, you know, you know, you've been stupid. But then is that saying, what did they say? One is too many, thousand never enough? Yeah, and, and they say one is too many and a thousand's never enough. That's so true. Yeah. And 20 million is never enough. Never mind a thousand. Because it's you're always saying, I'll just have one drug yes. or one drink. Yeah, and that's it. And, and then it's like, that one's never enough. Yeah, and then and then, then you, okay, then now you're drinking uh, like a little drink. Next thing you'll have a line of Coke. Next thing you... Snorting, next thing you, you spiking, next thing you do, it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And there is no, per, there is no way, once you um on the rapids going down the river and you're hitting rocks, you say, dear Makai, you don't know where you are. You, 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 all you are doing is living day to day, doing the same thing over and, over and, and talking the biggest load of nonsense that you're going to get do something different tomorrow, but you're not. Deep down, you know you're going to do the same things. I don't do illegal things. What I do is legal, luckily, but it's not morally right. I don't believe standing at the robots asking people for money, to, for food and whatever else you're going to use um, is the right way you should be working. So I think most people would go, then why aren't you working? Because I'm not, I can't be employed by somebody because I'm unreliable. It's unfair for me to be employed by somebody because of my unreliable. I, I can't tell you I'll be at work every day at eight o'clock because I could be waiting. I, I paid the, the merchant. Now he's got the money and I'm waiting for the drugs. I'm not going to leave my money, which I've paid him and, and walk away and go to work with no drugs in me. 
Now, the merchant comes up with some long story that he was robbed. Now, you must sit and wait, 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 wait. Now, next thing is 9 o'clock. You went to be working at 8 o'clock. You haven't slept. You've been there since 11 o'clock the night before waiting for this. And you're pretty irate. <laughs> Something that I, like, learned about you in the short time we've known each other and mm-hmm. we've been talking is that you're brutally honest. Yeah, too much. That's what gets you into trouble. And I think that's quite an amazing thing because a lot of people that I meet that live on the streets that mm-hmm. I talk to, they deny drug use. They say, no, I don't use drugs. Or it's it's always someone else's fault. Yeah, yeah. I've also got that little bl- blame. We all have. We, we, we like pointing fingers because... But we all know that, that one finger pointed out and how many fingers pointed at you. And that is the truth. But... To be honest about something, I'm, I'm not clever enough to, be, to lie. You have to be very really clever to lie. And if you, if you lie, you're going to get caught out. I'm, I hate, if somebody knows that I've, I've talked nonsense, I can't look at them. Even the, the, just because I'm a drug addict doesn't make me any different. I've still got my standards and my morals and my mother did bring me up, right? It's not her fault that I'm on the streets. She's dead and I rest in peace. And if she was alive, she'd probably be, giving me a hiding with an egg lifter like she used to. She also had an addiction problem. Nobody ever banished her. It's, Tuck has got a bad name. So is that what you use, Tuck? Tuck, Tuck, yeah. Is Tuck, that the only thing you use? No, and buttons. My, my, you have to have an up and a down. It's, it's stupid. You take, you take yourself up so that you can take yourself down. So that you, you wake up in the morning and you must take the wake up one. You go to sleep at night, you must take the go to sleep one. Why didn't you just leave them both alone? And then, then you wait. can wake up and go to sleep on your own. Yeah. But uh, humans, we strange things. We look for, in the beginning, it's an adventure and it's fun. And it actually affects you, but it does something to you. Like, oh, that felt like a, uh, But now I just moan about it all the time. And when was the first time you used drugs? 1974. I tell you, 1977. I was in Senate 7 on Ascension Day, 1977 in Seapoint. With people that have come past me now since and asked me how, am I, how come I'm on the streets and then what's going on, why are you on the streets and this and that. How come on, Gary, this and that and this. You were the cleverest in our class and all that. But I forget, I, I must remind those people all the time that, but you were the guy that gave me the pipe. I didn't want it. Was it pure pressure? Pure pressure, yeah. And how did you feel when you took drugs? Not good eh, in the beginning. Eh? I used to hide away and get you know, hiding cupboards and stuff like that. Not good. The other people, like they, ooh, they bow and go and go. They, I hide away. And even when I used to drink, I used to get hide away. Like, then I got confident afterwards. Then after I got over the complex story, I did drugs, alcohol and drugs from, 90, from, from then, right through my army time, right through my job life, my work history. But I was always in control of it. I thought I was. And I was. I used to get to work on time, earn good money, pay people their, their salaries on time, a functioning uh, addict. But as soon as I touched stick, I knew this was problems. And I went to go speak to a guy that was working with me, my partner at the time. I must go into rehab. He said, you can handle anything. You've taken it all. And, I mean, I couldn't handle it. I just was trying to tell these people that I can't handle it. And they, they wouldn't listen to me. So you were reaching out for help? You see, yeah, people always tell you what you want. As an addict, they never ask you what you want. It's a strange thing. How do they know what I want? How does anybody know what you want? You know what you want, so ask me what you want. I think most addicts don't want to use drugs. No, yeah, they're There's, actually hot full of it. We hate it. Yeah, yeah. But it's just very hard to stop. It, you, I wouldn't say you can't because I've done it before, but you, you need support. You can't do it alone. Mm. You, you, you can still maybe go do it alone and go to NA, but eventually in the end of the day, you're going to get lonely. Like, like, like you said, like you, you go to NA just for the social side of it because you're lonely. You've got no friends anymore. All your friends are druggies and alkies and whatever. But yeah, you, I mean, you, 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 now you're this guy that's clean and sober and picking up weight. I was 78 kilo, kilograms. That's I, when I went into rehab, mm-hmm. I weighed... Um, 64. Yeah. When I came out, I weighed 86. You see, me as well. I was uh, uh, like shot up. And then apparently afterwards when you like level out, it comes back to normal. I was still busy shooting up. 
Dat was yeah. shooting up in my arm, but shooting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the weight. The weight was busy getting, and just getting bigger, and I was looking, and I was looking, I couldn't help looking at myself in the mirror. I walked past you. Check this out, yeah. He's a good look, like. <laughs> so you, you mentioned support structure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, do you, do you have family? I have, but they've given me up. They ride past me. My father, he's passed away since then. One time he came past me and, at the robot, he wound his window up. And my stepmother wouldn't let him speak to me. And I never ever spoke to my stepfather. The last thing that my father ever told me was, he'll never let me down again. Because he did it once before when we were like, I was a child. And the very next thing he ever did for me was let me down by riding past. He could have opened his window and thrown me in the back. I'm his eldest son. That's his second wife. So listen, listen to her, water, 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 and throw me in the back of the car and take me to wherever I must go. But he never did. At that point when he did that, right? That, yeah. Was, was there a lot of things that he had, had he had tried to help you before? No, he never, he, no. He has done his little bit of things, but not big helps. Like, mm. Come to courts for me, tell stories about how I had to grow up alone and all that. But no, they were not like. What do you mean you had, to, you had to grow up alone? My mother was a very strange woman. She was she was she was brought up to be uh, the the she was she came from a rich Afrikaans family, very rich Afrikaans family, probably one of the richest Afrikaans families. And she was meant to marry another Afrikaans guy in another town to link the two towns together, prearranged marriage. She met my father at a, at a, what's it called, stag party and met him at the stag party and basically ran away with him on a yacht the next day. They had already had the wedding rehearsals done. She had a dress. People were at the wedding already waiting for her. She ran away. Um, so she was brought up to be this rich aristocratic Afrikaans woman who, who, um, <coughs> who ran households and manners and stuff like that to be in this woman that had to be a normal person. And she couldn't handle that. So I was, I remember I was in an orphanage at the age of six. And when I came out, she said, okay, now you're out. Remember, I can get you sent back anytime. This is what she tells me. I can get you sent back anytime if you don't behave yourself. Your job is to look after your sister. My job is to be a child, man. You know? I wasn't allowed to be a child. I was her babysitter stroke. My, my sister's father stroke. Revive her, bringing her back to life. She tried to commit suicide a couple of times. I had a hard time childhood, but everybody thought my mother was this great woman, so I just played along with it. What led up to you living on the streets? I first moved out of my last accommodation that I stayed in. Nice place in Brooklyn, not the best area, but nice, nice place. A um, little Wendy house, which I built up and made nice. Then I, I moved into another place, also similar to that. And then I moved into a drug den. One of the most famous drug dens in the country, which closed down now, it's called Nines Building. It's a very famous building. It was in Woodstock. In Woodstock. That very first building you, you get in Woodstock when you are coming from town on the railway line. Um, By Gimpy Street. Yes. Just I've been in there many times. Yes. Now that building, I lived there. Imagine that. That's a scary place. Yeah. It, it was. Yeah, it's it was it's burned down now as well. Um, parts of it did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's and a lot, of, a lot of drug addicts yeah. live in there. A lot of gangsters live in there. A lot they of used to. Now they've closed it down. A now. lot of good people lived in there as well. There though. were some good old ladies and stuff like that. I, I'm a Christian, but I learned a lot about the Muslim religion from that place. Good people. Good people. The old ladies would come and help. Like they know that you're wasted out of your tree, but they'll still come and they give you a plate of food. You know? There's good people out there. They want to help us. Do you remember the first night that you weren't staying in a home, that you were living on the streets? Actual, actual street, after the building closed down, yes. After Nine's building closed down. The night before it closed down, they robbed me of everything. And like, not them, other people, I was walking back from the shop, they held me down. They weren't going to hurt me. They knew me. I'm a well-known person in Woodstock. And they went to my room where I was staying, which was meant to be emptied out, and they stole all my stuff, everything, my TV, my microwave, my iPhone, and I had a whole lot of stuff. But in a way, they helped me because I didn't know where I was going to take the stuff. Now I didn't have any stuff to take anywhere, so I was fine. I slept that night in town, in the corner of Strand Street and Batten's Crux Street. They stole my shoes. The next morning I woke up, I had a pair of pants and a shirt, and that's all I owned. And what emotions were you feeling at that time? Hot sore, hot sore. That time, 
My, the family think I was on the streets before that. They classify living in a drug den as living on the streets. I had my own room, own door, my key, I had a TV, I had everything there. Well, I wasn't living on the streets, I was living in a drug den. But living on the streets, if you're not fighting the humans, you're fighting the rats. If you're not fighting the rats, you're fighting the cockroaches. If you're not fighting the cockroaches, it's the ants. To the seagulls. Ooh, beautiful birds, seagulls, but they attack you while you're sleeping. Can you, can you tell us, you were telling me earlier about the story with the rats. I went to sleep. It was raining hard that night. And somehow I'd eaten something and, and my top teeth were hurting me. So I took both my sets of teeth, my false teeth out, which I've had in my mouth for 10, 10, 11 years already. All my teeth before that used to fall out of my mouth all the time. But these were well-made teeth, nice teeth. And I took them out and I put them next to me. I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning. Only my bottom teeth were there, and they weren't where I put them. I couldn't understand. I thought these people here where I stay, they're stealing my teeth. What's the story? And then I looked. No, it's been a rat. Little claw marks and, and, and poos. There. <laughs> they stole my teeth. The rats have joined in in the crime they have. The, the, the rodents are with the crime in Cape Town. That's why it's out of control, the crime. Even, you yeah. know? Yeah, I mean, speaking about crime, yeah. um, you mentioned that you've been arrested quite a few times. Yeah, mine's, mine's only drug-related things. I, I don't get involved in the stealing and the thefts and all that kind of stuff. I have got, him, I have got myself into trouble for that car. I bought stolen goods, locked up. Case eventually dismissed after you sit in months. The prison system, the whole system here is, the country's constitution is that you're innocent until proving, proving guilty. That's the biggest load of nonsense I've ever heard in my life. The only time that's, that applies is if you've got a lawyer and your own lawyer, not a state lawyer, your own lawyer. If you're, if you, if you're representing yourself or you've got a state lawyer, you sit in jail until the case comes up. There's nothing you can do. You, they first send you away to verify your address, but they've just arrested you from your address. How can they ver- not know where you stay? You st- there. A week later, you'll go back to court and they haven't verified it. So you must go back to Portsmouth. In the, all this is doing is making drug addicts into criminals. Because in Portsmouth, it's like a school, uh, it's like a university for criminals. You learn things in there about, crimin, about being a criminal that you would never have thought of. Like, like what? How to breathe while walking down the passage if the passage has got wind. Sounds ridiculous. What, to uh, keep quiet when stealing yeah, from yeah, people? Yeah, the wind is now making a noise. Now you must walk down the passage and if you make, don't make, if you're dead quiet, then they'll, then the silence, you'll hear the silence. You must actually make a little bit of noise so you blend in with the wind. It's all... Now, a person goes into Paul and he learns this. Before, he wouldn't have known that, so he wouldn't have even thought about it. Okay, now, if it's a windy day, what must I do? I must just go and rob these people in their house. But you mustn't. You must actually breathe deeper. Do, it's all... How long were you in Paul's Mall for? Uh, the longest I've been there is six, mu- six months. That was for an awaiting trial case when I still pleaded not guilty. Awaiting trial is a horrible place. Um, once you get sentenced, it's not so bad. If you've got a thing called further charges, it's the worst. Because you've now been sentenced for something, but you can't start your sentence until your other case is finished. Now you... You're lumbering around. And you don't know when the other case is finished. They can just remind that case forever. So in other words, you've got two cases that are, are running. The one's almost finished and the one will probably never be finished but it's holding that one back. Mm. You'll stay in prison for 19 years in a waiting trial. And what were the conditions like? It's a terrible place. It's a terrible place. They've cleaned the rats since I remember at one time they had rats problems. Rats were eating the people. The lice... Everywhere. Everywhere. Whatever you're wearing when you go in, you throw out when you're leaving. You, you wear it to, to wherever you're going to, and as soon as you get there, you take yourself and burn it. You, it doesn't matter if it's the best shoes you ever had in your life and whatever. Everything you have, throw away. And were you sharing cells with other people? I, was, I, I was sleeping that you actually sleep on shifts. In the waiting trial section, you, it's so busy, it's so packed. You would have to sleep in shifts? Shifts, yeah. Why? Because people are just on top of each other. There's too many people there. Not enough places to yeah, sleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you experience a lot of violence in prison? Not really. Um, I, you see, because of my background with the, with the gangs, I'm not a gang, a prison gang member or outside gang member, but I've grown through 
the, all the years, I'm, I've grown up with him. So I'm, whoopsie, I'm, uh, I, I, I can read what's going on. I'm not scared of them. And that's what they thrive on is fear. They, they think fear is respect. It's the total opposite. You can't have fear. You can't be fearful of somebody and then say you respect him. How can you? That just doesn't make sense. But these people think that that, that is respect. And that's what they thrive on. And once you have you show no fear to them, then they get upset in the beginning and then eventually they just accept you as, okay, he's my head, Gary, he lost some eight. But it's, it's just Gary. Yeah, I leave Gary because he, he'll just give you shit. Don't, give, don't go and um, uh, break into his tent or his house or his room because you're, you're going to suffer. You'd rather just leave him alone. If he asks you for something, say yes and here it is. And were you sober in prison? No. So no. You, you didn't even stay sober during prison? No. So you had narcotics in prison? Yeah. You, you, you can get it anyway. We all, we, like I know there's drugs in yeah, prison, yeah. but I didn't realise like the awaiting trial people would yeah, also be yeah. able to get drugs. Yeah, I mean... Where those people put those drugs, it's, I've seen people come in with, where did that big moose thing come out of your body? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, they call uh, it a prison wallet. Yeah, where the hell? I've seen a guy, well, I haven't, I've seen a guy, take a moose, a big phone, up his, I mean, come on, man. That's what what were some of the strangest things you saw in prison? A guy was getting released the next day and he tried to escape. <laughs> <laughs> but like a full on escape. That was probably the funniest thing I've ever seen him. Yeah. A full on escape. But he actually was scared of getting released. That's why he was trying to escape. So he can get caught. So he can get more prison time. They, it, it starts becoming home for some people. How do you make money? Because you were telling okay. me earlier that it seemed like back in the day you were a very successful yeah, businessman. I've I, I made money in, 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 in the, there. Um, I'm, one of my little talents I've got is, is I'm a tailor. I can sew. So that's one of the ways I make money. I've got self, I've got SIM cards into prison before. It's things like, stupid things I get. Like, like, but I'm saying b before all of this happened, like before you were living on the streets. Yeah, yeah, I was a carpenter. And, yeah. and but you, you also said you were a manager. Yeah, at, at first, I started, I left school, went to the army, the two years army. After that, um, I was going to be a draftsman, an architect. I didn't get to bursary because I'm colorblind. Okay, so I'm colorblind, so they don't give me the bursary for being a draftsman. So therefore, I must go and get another job, nepotism. I got a job at the receiver of revenue. Rose up in the ranks very quickly. I was very good at the job, found the job interesting. The people irritated me. I lasted five years there. I got half the most of my diploma I got. I've got income tax three to my name. and I've got, I did well there. I, was, I had my own little office and I was like this Mr. Barney with his fancy suit earning big money. Back in the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the deep Gary-ness, I always wanted to be a carpenter, designer, woodwork, architect kind of thing. That's why I wanted to be an architect, for the wooden parts of it. And so I became a carpenter. And out of all of your jobs, what was the highest paying salary you had? Carpentry. Carpentry. No, actually, I must, if I really must tell you the truth, the robots. The robots? I'm telling you. Working on the streets? I'm telling you. In the beginning, when I first started doing it, there was very few white people doing it. And it was a novelty scene of white guy on the road. But it was very embarrassing for me. Now it's not embarrassing. I've passed that stage. If people give me a hard time, I give them a hard time back. Um, at those days, if somebody gave me a hard time, I burst into tears. But I was making a fortune. And that's what made me stay there. How much were you making living on the streets, begging at the roads? If, if I tell you a figure, the people will all stop their work and start working on the streets. I was earning way over a thousand rand a day. So that's like 40,000 rand a month. Yeah, tax free. So it's like 80,000 rand a month. Jeez. And you never got a cent the next day for it. That's the sad part. You know how it goes. One inch to many, a thousand, never enough. And all you do is you So as you got the money, you're saying you would spend it on drugs? Yeah, not all of it. I'd buy things, but where are those things now? They're gone. They're things that, choop, choop, easy come, easy go. And um, then up until COVID, I was, I was earning up until the thousand. I was earning in the top section of close to two thousand market one stage a day, every day. What's the most money you've ever made in one day or one month living on the streets? Three and a half, four thousand rand, I suppose. Three and a half, four thousand rand. Probably about that. And do you remember what your biggest month was? Twenty seventeen. No, twenty eight. When I, the year I relapsed. 
that November, the first of the thirty first of November going into first of December, in an hour I made a thousand and eighty rand. In an hour you made one thousand and eighty rand. And eighty rand. I, put, I took the thousand rand, gave it to this one Somalian, which was my friend, told him to keep it, and I took the eighty rand and went to go and gamble with it. And I hit slot, hit, hit gambled on the big time. How much do you make? I don't know. But Monday morning I came through I came like to my senses and I had eleven thousand rand crumpled in all my pockets with drugs which I didn't even use in all my pockets. I still 11,000 rand. I, I won three times on one weekend uh, on the slots, on that weekend. The Friday night I won X amount on, the, on, on, the, on a little bit. On the low, the Saturday, Saturday morning on the three rand, on the Saturday early evening on the five rand. I probably made about, I don't know, 40, 30, 35,000 rand and I blew 20,000 rand in two days. Who knows where it went? I woke up and I said, all money crumbled everywhere. What, is, what are your biggest challenges living on the streets? The other street people. The loneliness, yes, but it's the other street, street people. It's not the people that, at the, that are driving the cars, not even the police. It's the other street people, by far. Are you scared of them? No. Um, I used to be. Um, they're scared of me. Um, it takes a long time to get to that point, though, because they just become... They're, they're a hindrance. You buy something or you get yourself into a situation where you can move to the next step and they'll block it. The company take a lot. They were going to give me, I was their pet sponsor for the year, two, two years ago. And I was supporting the guy on the street because, as I said, I was earning a lot of money. Supporting some other guy who didn't know how to scuttle, as we call it. And um, he, I woke up in the morning, I went to go and wash. I still bought him his morning fix. He didn't have any. It was these uh, Unga Copper people, you know, one of them. I went, I went to get bath personally myself. I came back, gave it to him. Ooh, very happy with me. I go and have a wash. While I'm washing, he steals, he steals my phone. He knows that phone was the step and the stepping stone for me to get off the streets. Because those people were gonna set me up in a little place like I want, away from the naughty people and naughty stuff, where all I do is do woodwork. And by doing woodwork all the time, it'll take my mind off the, the drugs and I, and I won't want to use. Mm. I've done it before. And I, I've, I've even done it while I've been, I don't call myself, I, was, I wasn't clean then, but I was almost clean. I was like, my dosage was down to like, phew. And a, a half a day kind of thing, a half of, of, of what, uh, just to get me out of my little uh, zombie state back to Gary. You know, that is, you must yeah. take one to wake up and take one to go to sleep. Uh, I was like half my dosage, I was using nothing. Spending like 30 rand a day on drugs. And I mean, you mentioned that you've had problems with gangs, right? Yeah. On the streets and stuff. Mm. And you said to me that, w w were you shot or stabbed? I was shot, yeah. How, yeah. how did that happen? Okay, um, I first broke my leg. It's the whole, this is the year 2021. I broke my, my hip. I had a hip replacement. Being the second hip replacement, they made it a total hip. My other hip was a total hip replacement. So this hip that I broke, they gave me a total hip replacement. This hip, the, the first hip that I broke, this is all linked to being shot. It sounds a long story, but the first hip that I got shot with, they kept me at the hospital. I had to fight to get out of the hospital. Like the second time I was in the hospital, now, that, now you're homeless. It's another thing. You're homeless. The first time I had a house when I broke my first hip, I had my place I was staying, I was renting, I was a good boy, I was working and all that stuff. I was actually injured at work. The second one, I was living on the streets. So they, as soon as you, at the operating theatre, they start prepare, kicking you out. But you've got nowhere to go. I had to scuttle 10 rand from somebody to get a taxi from Salt River, or to, from Observatory, to Woodstock, which I have got a support base there, which well, I'll tell you now which I don't, why I don't stay there anymore. We, I, I took me, I, I got onto the taxi and then they made me change taxis and I, the other taxi I was meant to climb on rode away and it took me five hours to get from Salt River or from Observatory to Woodstock. Five hours, which I could normally walk pr prior to that in six, seven minutes. But is your hip is I was walking on a four-wheeler four yeah. walker. Four, that, that four-legged thing, you know, with the, with the four legs and yeah, no yeah, wheels. Yeah. It's a wheelchair with no wheels. It's cruel. They don't even give you a chair to sit on. The wheelchair people at least got a chair to sit on. They got wheels. You know, and, and so you were walking? walking and yeah. I got robbed. 
They, I'm just coming out of hospital. They stole my painkillers. What else did they steal? The, my, I, I, I remember this. I had one cigarette and they stole that. My pa- and a jacket, which is full of, like, blood and stuff. They stole that. They steal just to steal. And they stole it. Anyway, I got, I got back. I got back to where I could have a roof over my head. That night, the first hip, replace, hip replacements, uh, the recovery of a hip replacement takes place in the recovery. That's where all the problems come in while you're recovering. You meant to be pampered and slept on. I slept on the concrete floor the first night out of hospital. That's six days after I broke my leg. I left the place on the Thursday and I was back on the Wednesday the next week. The next week. Obviously, I have a knee replacement. So how did you get shot? While I'm there at that place. Which place? Um, the HLG, the, the gang. One the gang, place in Woodstock? Yeah, the, the gang. One, yeah, the, the, ga- like the gang. With, yeah, yeah, one of them, yeah. Um, I was staying there because <coughs> I know all the people there through living in that area. Um, I can go stay there tomorrow if I want, but I don't, I'll never go back there. Um, I was then hobbling to the toilet and they were having a gang war with all the gangs in the area of fighting them. And I was busy hobbling to the toilet with my walking sticks and this one of those outside toilets went into the toilet having a poo just because while I, when I broke my leg, I got... I know the exact toilet you're talking about. Yes. It's that blue toilet that's, that's toilet, just been sitting yeah. there for like 20 years. Those toilets. They moved them across now. Instead of being where they were, they moved them to the other side of that dirty river. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the, dirty, the one in the middle of the passage. Yeah. I know exactly. That what dirty about. river, yeah. And uh, I'm in the first toilet. I hear the guys coming running. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, I think, oh, shit, here they go again. Then I, then I see the flashes going through on the left hand side of me, but it's going into this, they called it the pink house. It was a house there. They're shooting in there, but they're just shooting to empty the rounds. I made a noise in the toilet, like, because I'm on crutches. I'm trying to get out of there. I'm, I'm, I'm pooping myself, no, literally. As I'm trying to pull my pants up, the first bullet comes in through the toilet. They shot five rounds in there. Um, and it's a very confined, but it's just the toilet. It's very small, yeah. Very small. Five rounds into there, and only one of them hit me. I was reading every single round after the second one, which hit me. I was bending down, pulling up my pants, and the bullet went through my arm and out the other arm, it at an angle which is actually impossible to not hit a bone, but it didn't hit a bone. And when it hit me, I looked at my arm, it's like nine millimeters quite hard to hit your arm. That people say you don't feel anything, they're talking nonsense. It's sore, it's, it's like a thud sore. My arm, I look at it, okay, I'm not gonna die, but now let me stop myself from dying from the next bullets. And I started reading the bullets, because of the army, I knew where this, what this guy was shooting how you shooting and why you shooting wrong. So the next bullet I re- move back, next bullet I move back, the next one I move totally forward because the next bullet... So you're like gonna, dodging the bullets? Basically like that. You're like fucking Matrix dudes. <laughs> <laughs> and, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. And, and did you go to the hospital afterwards? Yeah. Private ambulances arrived because it's a shooting and everybody's worried. Yeah, I'm walking around just looking for a cigarette. Um, cops asked me questions. I'm cool, calm and collective. But then it started really hurting. And it was bad. I mean, you know, it was like, I mean, you got shot. And nine millimeter at this close range. Like we were, the toilet, they weren't, how can they miss? Come on, man. I'm sure the guy maybe wanted to miss me, but I don't think he did. He didn't know it was me inside there. If he had known it was he me. He just probably thought it was another gangster. He did. And, and I'm associated with that specific gang. You see, so I'm the. Since then, become a target because of that. That gang has since been, ugh, it's politics. I don't want to get involved in that because I can get myself killed for talking about that. So I'd rather leave that alone. But, but the, 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 the one gang that, that, that shot me, I was also involved in. I was actually almost like a founder member. But I'm not a gangster. It sounds funny. You're just involved with those people. Yeah. I, the gang I made them into when, when they were still youngsters was the Get Along Gang. And they were the get-along gang, which became the other gang now that shot me. But it's, you ask them why, why they were shooting there, they were told, they will just tell you because they were told to, to do this. And went X of mine and the mind's cup didn't die and die. It's all nonsense, man. It's all people's egos that have gone cuckoo. I want to talk about the streets again. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I want to know as a homeless person, mm-hmm. How do you think people, the general public, view homeless people? Um, 
I, I, I never used to understand it, but now staying there, I can see it why they, they don't look at us very good. It's like we the lepers of nowadays. The lep, like in the Bible, they had the, lep, the people with leprosy. Yeah. We are those dudes of nowadays. How do people treat you? 90% of them very well, but very, the 10% that are, are, are nasty are horrible nasty. And it's mainly race. I get it mainly from race. I don't know what it must be like to be a colored person on the street or a black person, but a white person, we deal with race mainly. Race is a big thing. In, it's bigger on the streets than it is in... What kind of things do people say to you? How can a white man be on the streets? Well, I mean, how can you ask me a question? How can ESCOM not be working? You know? How can, how can this be... How can a white man be on the street? Anybody can be a drug addict. And the, dra- the addiction is what put me on the streets, not the fact that I'm white. The, the addiction is what kill is what addiction, as you said earlier on, it's uncurable, but it's, um, what's it called? When, when you, when you aren't in music, uh, you can you put can it in limbo. You can be sober. Yeah, you can be sober, put yeah. it in limbo. Like, and that using is your choice. Being an addict is not your choice. you got no choice about it. And I wish I wasn't. Just to end off, I mean, mm-hmm. do you see a way out of this life? Yes. The only way you can get out of this life is to occupy your mind. And occupy my mind it would be to be a carpenter. So you would, you would want to get back working, doing I just something you're get, passionate about? Yeah, I just want to get need one or two power tools and a workspace so I can just get away from these people. Build, first of all, my house where I'm standing so I won't be homeless. From all of the things you've learned through your life, you know, mm-hmm. all of the struggles and all of the things you've gone through, do you have any advice for people that are also going through a tough time? We all know how to make ourselves happy. It's a simple thing. Just take a deep breath, put a smile on your face and sing a happy song. And all things bright and beautiful, or anything you song, or three little birds, whatever song you decide. Three little birds. That, I love that song. I, sing, I, mean, I wake up, you know, I sing, I wake up <laughs> in the morning, I sing that song. I'm happy for the rest of the day. We must remember that it's us. I must come right. Not I, Nobody else owes me a favor to help me. I must come right. But while I'm coming right, the people that I think would support me, please support me, man. Well, thank you, Gary, for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It's been it's an absolute pleasure. pleasure. And I hope I helped somebody out there. And remember, if you never, ever touch drugs, don't. Yeah, I agree with Cuck that. Cuck stuff. Sorry about <laughs> my language, but it's cuck. <laughs> it is. Every yeah. day. But anyway, thank you everyone for watching. This is the Wide Awake Podcast and I'll see you all very soon. Cheers.